introduce today's webinar, which is Soils Mapping. This is the second part of our Soils series. It's a, brought to you by PyMap Project. And today is a Soils Mapping and Overview. And this is provided to you by Ed O'Brien. And he's a forester and geoscientist with uh, Forestry and Land Resource Consulting, Inc. And I tell you what, we're very happy to have you here, Ed. I know this is, this is a great uh, honor and uh, a lot of work that you put into this. So I'm really looking forward to this. So I'm going to be quiet now and hand it back over to you. Thank you, Eric. Good afternoon and welcome. The title of this presentation is Making Forest Soil Maps Work. My name is Ed O'Brien, and I'm a forester and soil mapper. Looking over the list of those who have joined this webinar, I see a few friends and some very old friends I haven't seen in a while. Thanks for tuning in. My very old friends know I've been making soil maps primarily for intensive forest management for a good while. Today, I hope to share some of the things I've learned over the years to help you make soil maps work for you. Briefly, we will look at where you can find soil maps for silviculture, how to test those maps to see if they are suitable for your intended application. We will talk about how to create a new soil management group for your land area of interest, how to create keys to query the soil management groups and populate soil polygon attribute tables, and then run through some scenarios using soil maps as tools to support tactical allocation and strategic decisions. When we talk about soil maps, most people immediately think about the public domain NRCS soil surveys. There are a number of ways to access the NRCS soil spatial data set. There's a slick online tool called Web Soil Survey where you can draw a box around your area of interest or define an area of interest with your uploaded property boundaries. Or you can uh, download the spatial and tabular data and use it offline in your GIS system by going through the geospatial data gateway. I understand the latest version of ArcGIS has the soil data set included in its online ready to use maps. And you may even have an old worn paper copy of a county or parish soil survey. But until you have it digital and in a GIS system, it is really not easy to use. After all, for silviculture, after your stand layer, your soil layer is the eye in GIS. On the plus side, this spatial data is available everywhere. And with a little practice, you can generate many theme maps and, and reams of tabular data. On the downside, the maps are general purpose and vary in quality and intensity. So you have to evaluate how to make sure they will work for your application. A lot of the maps are less detailed in the woods than they are in agricultural areas. This was by intent. At one time, there was a belief that detailed soil maps were not needed in the forest. So there are a lot of forested areas that are mapped using soil associations, which is a less detailed kind of soil map than that typically found in the county level soil mapping for agriculture. The tabular data is also somewhat general in nature, so you may not have an interpretation of the soil map unit that will help you make a specific decision. Usually you can find some information about management concerns like erosion hazards or equipment limitations and a base age 50 estimate of site index but you generally will not find a ranking of the soils for species suitability or a ranking of inherent fertility, both of which may be important for intensive forest management decisions. A lot of commercial entities also decided that they wanted to make different soil maps than those available publicly or at the time there were no publicly available soil maps. So if you work on land with a previous industrial ownership history, you may have access to this kind of mapping. That is, if it didn't get lost when the land changed hands. 
these maps were made especially for intensive forest management internally by the companies. The interpretation of the data underlying soil polygons has been queried to extract the information needed to enhance silvicultural decisions. You know, thus, tactical and strategic decisions can be enhanced by visual, spatial, and quantitative analysis of the land qualities or soil properties. But optimization of soil-based silvicultural regimes requires current knowledge and future expectations concerning products, product prices, available treatments at their cost, and past management practices. Because these factors are continuously changing, soil-based prescription recommendations should be frequently reviewed and updated as necessary. Unfortunately, uh, much of the land classification data that were produced by industry were lost during the last 15 years as forest industry consolidated and then divested land. And even if you have a legacy spatial soil data set, you may find the management attributes assigned to the soil polygons batch past management practices and need to be updated to match your current management. To do that, we will want to follow the same procedure we are going to outline to make public domain soil maps work. Now, let me mention IP briefly. IP consolidated before they divested. They got into all kinds, they got all kinds of different soil mapping systems and put these into a huge soil library that already contained 5 million acres of their own in-house mapping stretching from Texas to North Carolina. Uh, they grouped all the series into CRIF groups, and we'll discuss CRIF groups in a minute. They modified those groups with depth, drainage class, the nature of the subsoil. And they grouped these groups and created lookup tables for their prescriptions. This was known as the strategically aligned integrated silvicultural system, as it also took into account distance to the mill and other non-soil factors. I admire their ambition and solution for creating a way to deal with a huge soil spatial data set derived from a variety of sources. And I mention this because there are probably 10 million acres of industrial forest land with this effort in place across the southeast. It's well worth drilling into. And and as a historical aside, yeah, can, we, can we interrupt you for one second uh, there? T.S. Yeah. Coyle was a Duke University professor. Yes, sure. Can, can, can I ask you if you uh, would wouldn't mind sure. maybe moving your microphone back a little bit from your mouth, and then if you'll take the slider bar that's up in the okay. top left corner, just above the talk button, and kind of move that up a little bit. We'll see if we can clear up the uh -huh. audio. Uh, there's several that are having trouble hearing. Okay. That, is that any better? Uh, test, test, keep going. I'll let you. One, I'll let two, you know. Three. That's better. Test, test, test. Okay. Yes, much better. Well, Thank I, you. I'll get into it. Okay. As a historical aside, T. S. Coyle was a Duke University professor, and you've probably seen his name on site index curves. Uh, but he also had a consulting business that did forest soil mapping for industry in the 50s. So foresters have recognized the need for soil-based silviculture for quite some time. And some of this coil mapping is still around, and it's pretty good mapping. Uh, most of it's been transferred from its original blueprint to uh, digital. And, and neither, neither of these two lists are uh, complete. There are similarities and differences between these different sets of spatial data, but if you have access to it, it's well worth drilling into. Okay, it really doesn't matter if it's public or legacy soil maps that are you, you are using. You need to do a few things to really make them useful. We want to test the soil polygons against the land. We want to develop 
soil management groups. We want to develop and test keys that query the polygons by soil management groups. And we want to test and refine those keys against the land. Do the soil polygons match the land? at the scale and intensity you need to support the decisions you're trying to make. This, this is a portion of soil surveys on the county line between Cleburne and Randolph County, Alabama. In reality, the soils are equally complex in both areas. The county to the north was intentionally generalized. Variability in quality and intensity from county to county it's something you just have to deal with with using NRC maps, or any maps for that matter, for your soil base. It's like having one contour map with five foot intervals and another with 50 foot intervals. It's not that the maps are wrong necessarily, they're just not the same. Zoom in on the western edge of this map. Uh, see this polygon that uh, looks like the head of a seahorse? Here's, here's the same polygon over here. These, these polygons that are in red show the level of detail used in some proprietary mapping. So, so the map to the north might not be suitable to make some tactical decisions. If the maps don't show the land the way you need it shown to support your decisions, you just don't use them for that. It's like using a 50-foot interval contour map when you need a 5-foot interval contour map. You have the wrong tool for the job, but you'll be disappointed with the results. But if the maps look good, we'll progress to the next step and look at developing soil management groups. Here's a soil management group example. This is the CRIF system. It was developed at the CRIF co-op when that was still alive at the University of Florida. For those of you too young to remember CRIF, it was an industrial co-op focusing on slash pine fertilization. It's like what's now known as the Forest Productivity Co-op based at NC State and Virginia Tech. The soil properties used to create these groups <clears throat> included horizon depth, drainage class, special horizons, and it was rapidly and enthusiastically adopted by forest industry when introduced. After all, it took all the complexity of the soils in the southeast and boiled it down to ABC. It works good in Florida and up the Atlantic coast, which is the specific land base where it was developed. It's not so useful on the upper coastal plain, Piedmont, Ridge and Valley, and Appalachian Plateau, or the Russ Hills of Mississippi, or the western Gulf Coast. But recall, IP used CRIF groups as in their consolidated land classification system. So it's a good place to start when making soil management groups, especially in the Atlantic Coastal Plain and Eastern Gulf. <clears throat> Here's another soil management group example. This is a generic grouping that works reasonably well in the lower western Gulf Coast. Notice there's no mention of uh, spodic horizons any place. They don't exist in this area. The point is soil management groups should be created based on your area of interest. Here again we have, uh, we're talking about horizon depth, drainage class, special horizons, and soil texture. And sometimes, or oftentimes, it helps to have major breaks and then subdivide. Here, here we're grouping all of our upland soils in a supergroup, and all of our flatwood soils in a supergroup. 
all the fluvatile soils get put in one group, and then it's always useful to me to take uh, uh, the marginal soils, the badlands, and uh, put those in a group of their own. Here's, here's another example from the forest productivity co-op. The properties used, again, include drainage class, special soil characteristics, horizon depth, and soil textures. Uh, maybe you've noticed some repetition. Soil properties that, that Dr. Barkowitz talked about yesterday. Horizon depths, drainage class, special horizons, and soil textures. But the point is, not all soil mapping products have good soil management groups, if any at all. And to make them work for you, it's most helpful to develop soil management groups for the specific land base that you are interested in, to turn your soil maps into land classification systems. A, a soil management group is simply taking all of the soil map units in a survey area and grouping those together, uh, those that you think will manage similarly, usually based on soil properties. And, and this is really a thinking process. You are creating your own specific applied classification system for a practical purpose for your area of interest. Soil management groups often follow physiographic provinces. For those of you, just those of you east of the Mobile, what kind of land do you most identify with? Is it, is it the Ridge and Valley, Appalachian Plateau? We'll include the Highland Rim and Cumberland Plateau in Alabama. Uh, the Piedmont, stretching from Virginia to eastern Alabama. How about the upper coastal plain and sand hills? The Atlantic flatwoods, including the sandy soils and sand pied soils on the Florida Gulf Coast, or the eastern Gulf Coastal Plain, uh, including the fall line hills of Georgia and Alabama, the Daughtery Plain, the Tifton Upland, and even the Black Prairies of Alabama. I see four in the Piedmont, a couple in the Atlantic flatwoods. How about for those of you uh, east, uh, for those of you west of Mobile, what kind of land do you identify with most? The Lust Capped Hills of Mississippi, the Western Gulf Flatwoods from Hancock County, Mississippi, west through the Florida parishes of Louisiana, across the Atchafalaya Basin, western Louisiana, and into deep east Texas. The upper Gulf Coastal Plain, the interior flatwoods of Mississippi and Arkansas, and we'll put the deltas in that category, but that could easily stand alone. Okay, most everybody's answering the upper Gulf Coastal Plain. Thanks. That's interesting. Use use the physiographic provinces that you work in to help define the supergroups for your soil management groups. We'll, we'll want to develop and test keys to query polygons by soil management group. Every item in your soil legend goes into a soil management group and then develop decision support keys by that soil management group. Refine the keys by making divisions within soil management groups, and the decision support keys can be 
very general in nature or very specific depending on your need. These are just some examples of the different kinds of decision support keys you want to develop based on the soil management groups you decide define for your area of interest. This is an example of a key, a decision support key. This is one that Tom Fox published in 2004. You can see over here, if we use the CRIF groups as a soil management group, everything that's in CRIF group A just flows through and uh, is designated as a loblolly species soil management group. And here in the CRIF group B, we use a non-soil factor to uh, uh, rust hazard to go one way or another in your decision key. And then uh, add soil productivity or site index to reach a decision. This is one way to make a key. Here's, a, here's another key. This is an example of a part of a slash pine juvenile fertilization response plus application timing key. This soil group one, we'll say, has a base site index of 55 and a fertilized site index of 65. Before you fertilize it, you need to make sure you have adequate stocking and it needs to have its fertilization done by age three. You notice soil group two and soil group two here, based on drainage class, have different base site indexes and have different ages at which they need to receive the, the P application. And soil group three down here is different. Now, this key or function delivers exactly the same result as the previous key. It is structured differently as each soil management group is treated as a due case. If we've done a good job of defining our soil management groups in the first place, we shouldn't have a whole lot of branching because we've chosen land that's all going to manage similarly. This style of programming or key design is my favorite. It's just what I found works best for me, and it's easy to put into a programming language so that you can automate the querying of your soil polygons. Remembering that optimization of soil-based silvicultural regimes requires current knowledge and future expectations concerning products, product prices, available treatments and their costs, and past management practices. And because these factors are continuously changing, prescription recommend, recommendations that support your decisions should be frequently reviewed and updated as necessary. When you, when you set up your keys like this, if you need to refine your keys, you can make a change to one soil management group without causing unintended consequences in another soil management group. What, what I've hoped to try to accomplish here is giving you a conceptual framework for dealing with soil maps and using them to support your decisions. So, so I'd, like, I'd like to move forward into actually using some soil maps to make some decisions. We have our soil maps. We have decided that they are suited for our purpose. We have chosen our soil management groups. We have constructed our decision support keys. We have used the keys to populate the attribute table for our soil spatial data set. 
And now it's time to use these maps to help us make some decisions. We can use soil map for tactical decisions. Our scenario is we have a natural mixed stand that is clear cut. This is P deficient wet flatwoods. The owner's objective is intensive production plantation forestry and to make bunny. Uh, I think this is a fairly common scenario. Here, here's our stand post harvest. It's like a lot of coastal plain in both the Atlantic and the Gulf. A couple of feet difference in and sometimes just a half a foot difference in elevation makes a big difference in productivity and soil drainage class. After all, we manipulate soil drainage with beds and in some places ditches to make this very kind of land more productive. Here is the same land. This has our loblolly We've used our Loblolly priority key to color this map. Number one is our uh, best Loblolly land. Number two is our next best Loblolly land. Number three is our third, the, the, the number three down the list. And this zero over here is really not pine land. But this all looks like wet flatwoods to me, so, so I'm not going to pay any attention to this soil map. Through culture and soil amendments, I'm going to overcome all these limitations. I'm going to treat the entire stand the same. I'm going to bed it. I'm going to fertilize it. I'm going to use good weed control, and I'm going to use great wild barley seedlings. I'm going to put the full meal deal on it. And there's so much debris left out here. I'm going to even pay some money just to push stuff around to do nothing for the productivity of the site, just so I can get it here to make the beds. So now I've got the full meal deal supersized. But that's going to be OK, because I'm going to grow 8 to 10 tons per acre per year out here, and it'll pay for all of these treatments. Oh, shoot, at age six, this is what I've got. I've got some survival problems and productivity issues. If I look in here, I don't have a very good stand. I don't have a very good stand back over in here. Now I'm out to 10 years old. Now I have two stands out here. I've got a stand here, and I've got a stand here. They're all one stand on paper, but I'm really dealing with two stands. So now I'll be dealing with issues concerning timing of the thinning and other mid-rotation stand treatments. You know, one of the big advantages of intensive plantation management is uniformity. And if you don't get uniformity, those advantages go away. My 10-year cruise show that I have apparent site indexes as indicated. So, so up here, I've turned site index 60 slash land into site index 80 log land. That was my objective. But where I spent $500 an acre to turn site index 60 slash land into site index 60 law ball land, down here I failed to meet my objectives. So, so maybe what could have I done? I could have, I could have split the stand like this and maybe flat planted slash over here at a low cost and just done my over here at a low cost and just done my intensive management on this side of the stand. 
or I could have even done, uh, you know, maybe even, uh, maybe I could have done even some more precision kind of, uh, forestry and put something like an SMZ through there. And just focused on this land, this land here, and done some more extensive kind of flat planting of slash in this area. I've got, and instead of get, getting my 10, 8 to 10 tons per acre per year, we're going to get be lucky to get 5 tons per acre per year because my yield here has been diluted by my performance here. Sean, I'm trying to clear some of this stuff. Okay. What would you like to clear? I have a, that, That's. Uh, I'm just trying to clear that. Yeah, I'm trying to clear that right there. Okay. I'll be moving on. I won't stay on my next slide. I don't guess. Right. It goes away when you move to the next slide. I, I, I have a, okay. I, I have a friend who says that it takes 300 acres of this kind of land to grow 10,000 cords of wood in 25 years, and 75 acres of this kind of land to do the same. Was I wrong to intensively manage this entire stand? Not necessarily. It's not that putting the full meal deal on this soil will always result in an effective site index of 60. Maybe it was wet when the bedding contractor was here, or maybe it was wet after the bedding contractor left and these silty beds melted down. But I will always be accepting more risk that my stand won't perform when I manage these kinds of soils. Because the coolest thing about growing trees as an investment is your highest returns come off your lowest risk land. Isn't that powerful? High returns and low risk. And your soil maps help guide those decisions. Tactically and strategically. Let's look at another scenario. An entity manages, manages a fairly uniform, marginally P deficient soil catena. Historically, they use slash without fertilization. They've made the strategic decision to put 25% in the lob so that they can get all of the advantages of the excellent genetics. Here, here's my forest. We only have, we have our entire forest is uh, six sections in size. Here is a loblolly priority map. The dark green is my number one loblolly land. The medium green, my number two loblolly land. The light green or yellow, depending on your monitor, is the number three loblolly land. The red is poor loblolly land. And our blue soil polygons are SMZ kind of land. Here are the quarter sections that the harvest scheduler has picked.
now I've clipped my lob priority map by my harvest scheduler. And now I can begin to visualize visualize my plan. I'm looking I'm looking for land that is suitable to put my 25% uh, of this land into uh, uh, high performing law volley. And I look here I look at this quarter section here and I don't see very many opportunities there. I don't see very many opportunities there. I see a lot of dark green there and some dark green and light green here. So uh, I'm beginning to focus on this quarter section and this quarter section as places to pick uh, for finding the, finding the areas to put the uh, 25% uh, that I want to put in the law volley. Here is another soil map. This is a, the results of another key. This is a tillage or a site prep key map. The green is showing places where I can do uh, uh, chemical site prep. I'm expecting I would have to do bedding in the blue areas. Uh, low cost chemical site prep, high cost bedding site prep. So perhaps I could think about cutting out a 40 right there and maybe going with lob here, maybe I could shape something like that, plan on putting lob in there. I could probably get this 40 bed at the same time I'm having the contractor in here doing this land. As, as a result, I've been able to plan that I'm going to plant 200 acres of lob, that I'm going to chemical and machine plant, and I'm going to have to hit it with a pretty good application of phosphorus. I'm going to go ahead and plan on planting 420 acres in slash. I'm going to bed that, and I'm going to hit it with a lighter application of phosphorus. We looked, we looked at allocating species in this example, but you could use the same sort of procedure to do the same thing with a capital constrained budget. You know, suppose you asked for uh, $150,000 for fertilizer and your boss says you only have $75,000 to spend. You could use the same technique to pick the best places to get the biggest bang for your buck. Or if you didn't have as much money, you could drop the bedding here and drop the pea here and flat plant slash on this marginally pea deficient land. Or if instead of species, uh, you wanted to uh, go on an all lob regime and use the same techniques to allocate advanced genetics, uh, here you could uh, put your 420 acres into OP and here is where you want to put your 200, your 200 acres of MCP or flex stand with varietals. Uh, but again, we've, we've cho chosen our best land to do our intensive silviculture because the coolest thing about growing trees as an investment is your highest returns come off your lowest risk land. Okay. okay, here's another scenario. This time we're going to use our soil maps to make strategic decisions. We're an entity that wants to purchase 60,000 acres of privately owned land scattered across five geologic formations or soil associations. 30,000 acres is a mature natural pine stand, slightly managed. 
there's 15,000 acres in hardwoods and 15,000 acres in plantation management. There are a lot of questions to answer that could help support analyzing a potential purchase price. For example, how much of the hardwood stand is suitable for intensive pine culture? Is the land and plantation management growing at or below potential? What's the nature of the land in natural pine? Let's work on that last question. First thing we're going to do is we're going to set up our soil management groups. What we've done is we've clipped the soil maps by the polygons to show the potential purchase. And now we want to create our, create our soil management groups. So we've got a whole list of different soil map units, and we need to decide how to group those. We put together some super groups, uplands, flatwoods, rivers and streams. Notice this is quite a large expanded list compared to uh, uh, the one we looked at in the example earlier on. And then we have our marginal soils down here. For each of the soil management groups we've created, we have created basically the keys. And the keys are basically what we put in this table, the native productivity, the managed productivity. A P deficiency rating from 0 for non-pine soils to 1 for our most severely P deficient soils to 4 for our non-P deficient soils. We've assigned a site prep regime to each one of the soil management groups, uh, either chemical or beds. We've assigned an operability class to each one of the soil management groups from 0 to 3 to 10 to 12 months. And, and we've gone ahead and created a convertibility key. How easy is it going to be for us to take this natural pine and turn it into a intensively managed pine plantation? So after we've created our keys, we populate the attribute table with the key results. And here, here's a pivot chart summarizing the results. This is just for our uh, this is just for our natural pine stands, the 30,000 acres that we have. Look here, we've got 4,000 acres that is in natural pine stands that our soil map says don't even belong in pine. Well, maybe these are S areas that are going to end up in SMZs. Maybe some uh, uh, land that's flooding really too wet to intensively manage pines is currently in natural pine, or maybe it's misclassified. Maybe we ought to get boots on the ground to check out this 4,000 acres. Look at this 8,000 acres over here. Uh, that's going to require, it's, it's got a low level. Uh, it needs phosphorus fertilization. It's going to need beds. If we're going to have intensive forest management on this 8,000 acres here, uh, it's going to be expensive. We've got another 7,000 acres here. Uh, we could just use chemical site prep on it so we don't have the expensive beds. But we can see that this has an upland P deficiency. So uh, we're also we're going to have to fertilize this to turn it into uh, a, a good intensive pine plantation. But look at look at this here. We've got another seven or eight thousand acres between these four units. It's Easily convertible, has a fairly wide operability window, can just have chemical site prep, uh, isn't going to need any phosphorus except maybe a little over here later on in the rotation, is, and it's going to turn into some pretty nice land. Well, this, this is the 7,000 acres. 
where your highest returns are going to come off your lowest risk land again. It'd be nice if all 30,000 acres were in this category, and then maybe we could offer more for a purchase price. But wouldn't this kind of information be useful to somebody who was trying to analyze uh, a potential purchase? And uh, this kind of information can come by querying your soil polygons and uh, with the appropriate keys to help make strategic decisions. So we've looked at different sources of soil maps. We've talked about testing the maps. We've talked about making the maps work with soil management groups and decision support keys, testing refine and refining the keys, and then using the maps to make tactical allocation and strategic decisions. I'll go All ahead right. and take any uh, questions um, now. I've got a question from Toby. He asked if it if there is any particular shading color or crosshatch pattern for each soil type. He uses AutoCAD LT 2014, so a fill pattern that, could download, that he could download would be very useful. Not my area of expertise, Sean. I really, really don't know anything about AutoCAD. Uh, I use ArcGIS and just uh, choose the just choose whatever uh, whatever colors I want to use to color my maps. I uh, <clears throat> don't know about cross hatching with AutoCAD. Sorry about that. Does anyone else have any questions? I see a few you typing in there, so we'll give them just a minute. Tim Milling asks, do you drive much information, or I'm sorry, do you drive much info from existing descriptions and which ones? Do I derive much info from uh, I, I guess I don't understand the nature of what Tim is asking for there. Um, wh what kind of descriptions? Are soil descriptions? Well, he gets back to that. Um, we'll move on to Bill. Um, he asks, would you compare the advantages of high resolution color IR versus the true color images available on the internet? High, high resolution color IR is, I'd rather use that than I would true color images to uh, analyze land, uh, especially leaf off color IR. Most of the true color images available on the internet are uh, leaf on. So uh, yeah, I prefer uh, leaf off true color Leaf, leaf off color IR versus true color images. Our next question then comes from Mark, and he asks, would the same process work for ecosystem service planning and sales? Um, I, would, I would think so. Uh, Yeah, I'm. I'm not. I'm not sure exactly what Mark is asking. Uh, a, uh, he he clarifies carbon, water, wildlife, etc. Yes, yes. You would just you would just have some. Uh, uh, yes, you would just have some. Your your keys would just have to be made and suited to. Uh, uh, 
uh, the ecosystem service you're working on. Uh, yeah, you could you could make these keys were specifically for intensive pine plantation management, or the examples were intensely intensely fleet managed pine plantation. But yeah, you could make keys uh, for any application and, and use the same process. I think I think the key is getting good soil management groups and putting this putting the soils in the appropriate group and then refining and testing the keys. It needs to be an ongoing process. Um, to touch back on Tim's question about deriving existing descriptions, he clarified which soil descriptions provide the best information for forest and ag. Um, I, uh, well, the, the only I, I really I can't answer that question. I, I don't understand exactly what. Uh, let's see. Yes, which soil descriptions provide the best information for forest and ag? Well, the only soil descriptions I'm really familiar with are those provided by the NRCS. I like to use uh, geologic maps, and I like to use uh, uh, LIDAR when I have it to make soil maps. Uh, the soil descriptions will tell you the soil properties, uh, the, the things that I think are most important for forest management are in the southeast drainage class. After drainage class, thickness of the surface, thickness to the argillic horizon. Um, special horizons enter into it, uh, but Drainage class is probably number one. Uh, after that, landscape position comes into it. And inherent productivity is important for forest management. Does that answer the question? And, and where, where, where you get those land qualities uh, uh, really doesn't matter. Um, you might notice a browser window po pop up. You can take this quiz to get your CEUs for attending this session. We'll do one last question, just to not ignore Toby here. But he asked, in general, is there any relationship between soil maps and geology maps? Y yes, very much so. Very much so. In fact, the ge geology map, the, the geologic formation is, is much like uh, what we were talking about is the, the physiographic province. Uh, you know, they're not ex not necessarily exactly the same. In fact, they're more detailed. But uh, geologic formation, especially surficial geology, is very important. Uh, a lot of what we know about uh, inherent fertility of our soils is based on what geologic formation they fall in. Tim also follows up. Can you give us a soil map scale that seems most useful? Well, just to, just to view it, one to fifteen, eight forty is good for forest management. Now, scale doesn't mean as much as it used to, because. Uh, Using an, a GIS system, you can zoom in and, and and scale back depending on on what you're doing at the particular time. But uh, just as far as a published map goes, it works good. One to fifteen, eight forty. 
All right. Uh, if there's no more questions, if everyone, you might look at what Eric Taylor wrote. There might be a slight delay on the survey, but it will be working soon if it isn't already. And with that in mind, um, thanks, thank you for everybody for coming. This was all made possible by the Forestry and Natural Resource Webinar Partnership between the NC Cooperative Extension, SREF, and the Texas A&M Forest Service, funded by the US, USDA and PineMap. I just want to again appreciate or thank everybody for coming out. We appreciate your time, and have a great afternoon. Also, this room will be closing shortly, so if you want to hang around, you may suddenly find yourself with a closed window. Well, here we are again. Okay, I just finished the uh, survey and quiz and the CEU form. I got my everything worked fine. That's good to hear. Is there a um, mass way to get a just a huge exodus of all the participants? Yeah, you just select them, just shift down all the way, and then remove. Does that I just, work? I click the top one, I hold the shift down, I click the bottom one, and then right mouse click remove participant. Okay. I figured that would work. I just didn't want to just didn't want to experiment with something I wasn't sure of yet. <laughs>